Welcome to day three of Trihackney's annual Advent of Cyber, where each day leading up to Christmas unlocks a brand new beginner-friendly challenge where you learn, investigate, and outsmart King Malhe's chaotic holiday schemes. <laughs> And with over $150,000 worth of prizes up for grabs, you're not gonna wanna miss this. Today's challenge features Splunk Basics. Did you see them? I think I said that right. Where you're going to learn my favorite, how to ingest and parse custom log data using one of the most widely used data processing platforms, Splunk. It's almost Christmas in Wareville, and the team of the best festival company is busy preparing for the big celebration. Everything is running smoothly until the sock dashboard flashes red. Oh, 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 good heavens! A ransom message suddenly appears. The message comes from King Malha, the jealous ruler of Hopsec Island, who's tired of Easter being forgotten. He's sent his bandit buddies to attack TBFC's systems and turn Christmas into his new holiday, Eastmas. <gasps> oh, good heavens! With McSkitty missing in the network under attack, the TBFC SOC team will utilize Splunk to determine how the ransomware infiltrated the system and prevent King Malhe's plan from being compromised before Christmas. And after we're all done, we'll have covered how to ingest and interpret custom log data in Splunk, create and apply custom extractions, effectively use search processing language to filter and refine search results, lack a professional SOC analyst, and conduct an investigation with Splunk to uncover key insights into King Malhe's tactics, techniques, and procedures. Now getting into it, we won't need the attack box today as we're playing defense as the SOC team does. We will be needing a virtual machine, which can be started by clicking the start machine button. You'll have to wait a few minutes for the machine to boot up. Grab some hot cocoa while you wait. Once the machine is up and running, you can connect to the Splunk Seam dashboard that is hosted on the virtual machine by visiting the provided URL in your browser, where we're greeted with Splunk for Enterprise, a widely used SIM. For the exercise, the data has been pre-ingested into the SIM by our team's gracious security engineers. And if we select search and reporting, here's where we can post queries to search all the ingested logs. If we put in index equals main and switch the time frame to all time, we can pull up all the available ingested logs, 18,744 in our case. That's a lot of logs. And the purpose of Splunk is to parse those logs into a much more readable format and to allow analysts to query them fast because in a sock time is of the essence even minutes could mean king malhe's ransomware spreading to every device on the network now typically in a sim you have multiple sources of logs that get separated hopefully by parsing functions now if we select source type on the left column here we can view what log sources are available to us and the two data sets available are web traffic this contains events related to web connections to and from the web server and firewall logs which contains the firewall logs, showing whether the log traffic was allowed or blocked. So now that we know what log sources we have, we can refine our query to start digging for what we want. Now you can either select the log source in this window, which will pre-populate the query up at the top, or we can put the query in ourselves. Now it's important to understand what you're seeing in the SIM interface. Let's break down what we're seeing. Obviously the search query up the top here is where we build the query to dig up exactly what we want. In this case, it's web traffic. Time range lets us drill into specific time if we're wanting to see what occurred several minutes before or after a skunky looking binary executing or a weird network connection. Now the timeline here shows us visually a histogram of the distribution of the thousands of events that we've seen over time. This is really useful when trying to pinpoint when an attack occurred. If ransomware executed, it would have likely ran multiple processes, accessed and loaded lots of files and attempted to establish many network connections. Since this is web traffic where we see a spike in activity, that's likely the attack window when all of King Malhair's shenanigans started. The selected fields are the fields that we've currently chosen to be displayed in the summary column of the event list. Host, source, source type, they represent basic metadata about the log file itself. The interesting fields on the left shows all the fields that Splunk has either automatically extracted or manually added. Fields that start with the hashtag symbol, number sign, whatever you want to call it, are automatically generated by Splunk's time commands. Seeing things like user agent and client IP confirms that the logs are being parsed successfully. That's one thing to ingest logs. It's another thing
trying to parse them correctly. Event details and field extraction shows us the parsed details of a single event and what extracted fields are available. User agent, path, status, client IP, and everything else that's potentially useful. We can use what is available to refine our search. Now, let's try and find what day exactly we saw a spikes in logs using pipe time chart, span it to one day, which gives us accounts of total logs for each day. Now, as you can see, for most days, we've had roughly 500 events, and there's a clear spike across these six days. And if we hit the visualize tab, we get a visual representation. And if we go back to statistics and add sort by counts, we can sort it by counts instead of by day. And if we add reverse to the query, it will give us the day with the most events up at the top. Now that we know what days to look at and are the most sus, let's drill into those days and begin our hunt for indicators of compromise. Let's go back to events, select user agent. And if you don't know what a user agent is, it indicates what software initiated the web request. So often anomalous user agent strings will indicate malware, phishing, bots, etc. These are all the user agents seen in every event logged. And these long Mozilla ones are typically ones we would see. iPhone, Windows, Mac OS, but <clears throat> yeah, not, not that one there. This one here, not so typical. Red flag. Let's keep digging and check client IP. Oh, okay. Well, that's uh, a lot. Just a few hits for these IPs and 7,876 for one of them. Sheesh. That escalated quickly. And we're starting to see some indicators here. And if we check path, we can see what URI paths were attempted to be accessed. A URI, a unique resource identifier, if you don't know, can be manipulated to access a resource on the web server instead of a web page. So if we see something like ETC password, where Linux stores usernames and SQL database syntax, we have reason to believe something nefarious happened. So let's get fancy with our search query. Given that we have Intel on King Malhair's bunnies, use of scripts and tools, we can filter out the standard browsers. This ain't no hands of keyboard work here. So user agent not equals to Mozilla, Chrome, Safari, or Firefox. The syntax here is exclamation point that acts as a not and the equal sign, not equals. And if we now check the client IP, we can see all non-standard browser user agent strings were from the same IP, super sus. Let's make notes of that IP in our imaginary ticket notes, in our highly sophisticated SOC ticketing system. In usual attack situations, not all the sus activity is going to originate from the same IP. If we want to sort by client IP, we can add stats, count by client IP, pipe that into a sort minus count, pipe that into a head five, where the count by gives us a count of each unique client IP. The sort sorts it, obviously. And the minus count does the same thing as count with reverse, like we did before. You'll find that in query languages, there's multiple ways to search the same thing. And the head five just gives us the top five in the list in case there were hundreds of IPs. Now, let's hone in on the attacker IP that we found. We'll modify our query to search for the attacker IP and path and the path set to match common configuration files to see if we can spot initial probing activity. And note that these asterisks act as wildcards. So in this case, you'll find any path paths that contain PHP info and any strings that start with .git. And this table of syntax just outputs the columns that we're interested in. And now we can confirm that the attacker was using tools like curl, wget, zgrab to probe the web server, but was met with 401, 403, and 404 status codes, which are error codes for unauthorized, forbidden, or not found. This type of activity is seen during the reconnaissance stage of an attack where the bad bunnies are gathering info. Let's check other common file traversal paths using wildcard dot dot wildcard and wildcard redirect wildcard, which checks for redirect vulnerabilities. Now the output of this search shows what resources on the web server the attacker was trying to gain access to. Quite a bit. Let's add stats count by path, which shows us a count of each unique path. The fact that we see dot dot forward slash dot dot forward slash indicates the attack went beyond basic scanning to actual vulnerability testing to see if they could gain unauthorized access to files on the web server. And we can try and find the automated attack tool using the available query. Now this is checking for just the user agents that contain SQL map and Havij, but the output in the table is is focusing on the path and the status, with the 504 status code indicating a successful time-based SQL injection. Because the 504 code confirms that the database took too long to respond, the only reason the database would take too long is if it successfully executed the sleep command that we see in the path. Therefore, 
the injection was successful. Now we'll set our sights to seeing if there's been any exfiltration of data. And if we use the provided query, we're checking for paths that contain backup.zip or logs.tar.gz, commonly used zip formats. And again, we're wildcarding both sides so we can focus on finding those file types. With the output in the table being time, path, and user agent. The results of the query indicate that the attacker exfiltrated large compressed log files using tools like curl, wget, and zgrab, which we can confirm the details of these connections if we pivot to the firewall logs to see if those connections were allowed or blocked. These requests for sensitive archives indicating the attacker is gathering data or potential extortion. That's kind of the whole point of ransomware. But if you have data on top of that, you get double extorted. Now, if we do some more digging into anomalous paths and refine our search to look for bunnylock.bin or shell.php, which is a commonly seen command when attempting to establish a web shell, again, using wildcards, outputting the time, path, user agent, and status, the results clearly indicate a successful web shell. The attacker has gained full access to the web server and is able to run commands. This is called remote code execution, which is one of the worst things that you could possibly see on a web server. And this command here specifically, shell.php cmd equals period forward slash bunny lock dot bin. This indicates that this was likely the ransomware like program that executed on the server. Given that a dot bin file is a binary executable and it's named bunny lock. Attackers sure do love to name their ransomware accordingly. Now, if we pivot to the firewall logs to correlate what we've seen so far in the web traffic logs. So we're going to change the source type to firewall logs, set the source IP to the compromised server 10.10.1.5 in this case, and the destination IP as the attacker's IP, which we've established is coming from one IP, and check the firewall action to allowed. We're not interested in the blocked traffic. What successfully was sent out from the web server and outputs the fields that we're interested in. This query proves that the web server established what we refer to as an outbound command and control connection out to the attacker's C2 IP. And again, because all of this was action equals allowed, these were successful connections. And you also see the reason is C2 contact, further indicating a command and control connection. And lastly, we're curious about how much total data was exfiltrated successfully from the web server. This goes back to the previous search where we confirmed that archived files were being attempted to be exfiltrated. If we search the firewall logs now with the server's source IP and the destination IP of the attacker C2 server, action equals allowed, and we do some stats on the sum of the bytes transferred by the source IP, the results are in and we're screwed. 126,167 total bytes exfiltrated to the C2 server. If you convert that to sizes that most of us are familiar with, like megabytes or gigabytes, it doesn't seem like that much at roughly 0.12 megabytes, but these are compressed log files, folks. These are likely all text files. And to give you a understanding of what that could contain, at that size, that could still hold thousands of credit cards or social security numbers, thousands of lines of password hash combos, or the entire configuration and schema of a database. It's, uh, it's very concerning. Now this concludes our investigation. We found the identity of the attacker's C2 server where all the attacks originated from. We found the intrusion vector. The attack followed a very clear progression commonly seen by searching through the web traffic logs. We've identified the reconnaissance done via the probes using automated scan tools, which had been looking for configuration files and testing path traversal vulnerabilities. Finally, seeing some exploitation, the use of SQL map user agents and SQL payloads like sleep confirmed successful exploitation followed by payload delivery where we saw the execution of the command bunnylock.bin via a commonly seen web shell command and finally a C2 confirmation where we pivoted to the firewall logs and proved post exploitation activity because we saw firewall traffic from the internal server's IP to the attacker's C2 server IP. Now that we've completed the investigation, we can answer the questions down below. What is the attacker IP found? It is the one and only IP that we identified in the initial search for the odd user agent strings. Copy pasta that in. Correct. We've earned some points. Which day was the peak traffic in the logs that was found using the query where we used time chart, spanned it to one day and sorted it by counts in reverse in the same format that the Splunk output gives. Copy pasta that over. Huzzah. We've done it again.
What is the count of the Havij user agents? Events found in the logs. That can be found in the initial search that contained all the web traffic logs. By selecting user agent down at the bottom, we can see the Havij slash 1.17 had 993. Check that. Huzzah! <laughs> We've done it again. How many attempts of directory traversing to access sensitive files on the server? That could be found when we searched for the path containing the dot dot surrounded by wildcards and using the stats count by path syntax. You can see here the bottom one where we see dot dot slash dot dot slash is at 658 total attempts. Check that. I'm kind of in the way. I'm gonna hit that check. We're gonna hit that check. We're gonna hit that check. Woo! We did it. Huzzah! <laughs> and last but not least, we examine the firewall logs. How many bytes were transferred? Well, I emphasized it pretty well. How many bytes were transferred to the C2 server IP, to be precise, from the compromised web server? Quite a bit for compressed files. We discovered that value when we searched action allowed and did the stats sum by bytes transferred by source IP. 126,167 bytes transferred. Copy pasta that over. Last and final check. Can we do it? Can we complete the room and, and increase our chances of winning all the multiple prizes? Huzzah! We've completed all the things, except for this last one. If you enjoyed today's room, you can check out Incident Handling with Splunk. This is a medium level difficulty room where you can even further your knowledge of Splunk and Splunk query language. Final check button right there. Whoop. And maybe we get some fancy Spanish smashiness. Drum roll, please. Thrrr. We did it! Oh! Nice. Way to go, everyone. Give yourself a pat on the back. Now you can let everybody know on your socials that you're participating in TriHackMe's Advent of Cyber and maybe spread the word. Thanks for tuning in to day three of TriHackMe's Advent of Cyber. Wishing everyone the warmest and best of holidays. Merry Mad Hat Christmas.